for introducing the the talk as controversially as possible by 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 linking it to reservations i think half of the job of 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 trying to get the attention in a post lunch session has been achieved by by just packaging the talk 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 as a talk on reservations but 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 i hope to at least uh, uh, move beyond a general sort of a uh, generally charged debate on reservations to focusing on uh, what are the new contestations which are defining this clamor for uh, a, a showed representation for different uh, groups different minority groups different caste groups and i'm going to do that by asking more questions than i'm going to have answers for i am uh, so uh, i am very sure i'm very certain after 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 going through my uh, Uh, the files which i have the arguments that i have that that this is going to be really a tour of uh, all sorts of problems with only a few sort of uh, rough answers at hand and uh, i'll try to do that in this way i'll try to preview the debate on reservation as it uh, shaped up in the early 90s in the pages of supreme court uh, cases the journal uh, between professor mp singh and professor permanent singh and they really asked a very provocative question and the question was uh, do article 154 and 164 of the indian constitution uh, uh, guarantee fundamental rights in the sense that one could approach the court uh, asking for a writ of mandamus for implementation of reservation so this was the question this was the provocative question which sort of um, was asked by professor mp singh and he wrote in lengthy article on why it, why he thought article 154 and 164 guaranteed fundamental rights one could approach the court seeking uh, an implementation of reservation as a matter of right and professor permanent singh sort of gave a response to that uh, that article a rejoinder to that article i think it's important to remind ourselves of that debate because i think this debate tries to map the distinction between policy and principle those who believe that there is no fundamental right to reservation but only it's only a state policy which can be implemented if the state sort of makes a law giving reservation or makes a constitutional amendment providing for reservation but there is no such positive duty on the state to sort of uh, make reservation for minority groups on the other hand professor singh uh, believes that a combined reading of a, a harmonious reading of the fundamental rights with the directive principles of state policy should force the state to think of 154 and 164 as a fundamental right so i'll just sort of ac some of the contradictions which define these two positions and also try to highlight what new forms is this old debate taking in our times yeah let's look at article 164 what does it say nothing in this article shall prevent the state from making any provision for the reservation of appointments or posts in favor of any backward class of citizens which in the opinion of the state is not adequately represented in the services under the state so article 154 reads as nothing in this article uh, i would want to bring your attention to this phrase nothing in this article nothing in this article or in clause 2 of article 29 shall prevent the state from making any special provision for the advancement of any socially and educationally backward classes of citizens or for the scheduled castes and the scheduled tribes it's followed by article 155 which is a which is a, which is a product of the 93rd constitutional amendment it reads as nothing in this article or in sub clause g of clause 1 of article 19 shall prevent the state from making any special provision by law for the advancement of any socially and educationally backward classes of citizens as far as it relates to admissions in educational institutions one common theme in both these articles is that it starts with the phrase nothing in this article shall prevent the state and in article 154 it just says that nothing in this article shall prevent the state from making any special provision in article 16 for it actually identifies the reservation as this a special provision in case of 
uh, government posts and in, 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 in case of appointment to post in services. Now, how must we understand? Obviously, uh, there is one understanding which says that, I mean, what prevents the government anyway from, from making a special provision for doing a number of things, apart from the constitution? To say that nothing shall prevent the state from doing A, B, C is not to say the same thing as we shall actually force the state to do A, B, C. It merely says that the state shall have the right in its discretion, uh, the state shall have the discretion as and when it thinks fit to choose a policy to redress inequality as and when it, as and when it thinks fit. And the choice of this policy itself shall be the prerogative of the state, shall not, shall not be defined by the constitution itself. So the question really is, a phrase which starts with a non obstante clause like nothing shall prevent this state, it's trying to remove any confusion. It's trying to remove any confusion from the minds of those who think that reservation is anti-equality or it goes against uh, the guarantee of equality. So it's, it's more in the nature of clarification. It tells you that uh, the state shall have the power as and when it deems fit to implement reservation. But it cannot give you a choice of time and form and force it upon the state that the state shall be bound by, by this diktat to give reservation in this form as and when someone approaches the Supreme Court uh, for implementing that provision. That is one reading of, of this provision. Professor M.P. Singh obviously disagrees with this and, and, and he has, uh, is trying to summarize his very uh, influential article. Um, to sum it up, he says, so far, with very minor exceptions to be noted below, Articles 15, 4, and 16, 4 have been invoked before the courts only to challenge the state action and not any inaction. It does not in any way mean that a state inaction under these provisions is, incap is incapable of getting into the court. In fact, political situation has kept the state so responsive towards its obligation under these articles that the occasion to approach the court for enforcing that obligation has not arisen. The response of the state may not have been ideal, but it has left very little to be expected from the courts, which are already overburdened. There is, however, no reason to doubt that in case the state fails to discharge its obligation, under, under Article 15.4 and 16.4, courts can be approached. Failure on the part of the state will satisfy the conditions for the issuance of a writ of mandamus under Article 32 and 226 by the Supreme Court and the High Courts, respectively. At least one of the majority judges did, in fact, issue directions in the Mandal case, which is the 1993 Indrasani case, for the immediate implementation of the government notification, even though the petition itself was against the government notification. The constitutional position in this regard for MP Singh is too obvious to be pursued any further, which basically means that we have a fundamental right to reservation. We can approach a court tomorrow. Uh, as members of uh, other backward uh, class or scheduled caste and scheduled tribe and seek some sort of a reservation from the government. Professor Parmanand Singh, on the other hand, disagrees in, the, in, in, in this manner. He says, asserting a right is quite different from suggesting that something would be on the whole desirable or good. Rights have a special normative force. This special normative force is the result of invoking rules that we already accept and are committed to, rather than simply appealing to general moral considerations. If people are to claim rights, like a right to reservation, that are not recognized or conferred by any positive or actually ac accepted rules, their claims are vacuous. Only if we restrict the idea of rights to rights conferred by positive rules can the concept of a right have any definite content and val value. In our submission, the claims advanced in the guise of right to reservation should be accepted as social or collective goals or as a matter of policy rather than acknowledged as fundamental rights to be enforced by approaching the courts. In short, Professor Singh's thesis reading fundamental right to reservation in Article 15.4 and 16.4 is highly controversial and problematic even from the point of view of legal and social justice. So I think I have previewed the two ends of this debate and I am more or less inclined to sort of agree with Professor Parmanand Singh for the, for, for the following reasons. 
what does it mean to have a right without a remedy? Or what does it mean to have a right which cannot be enforced? In fact, the distinction between directive principles and fundamental rights for a number of people, for a number of commentators, has been that had the state, if the state had the capacity to enforce any of these principles, they would have actually followed, or they would have actually been a part of the fundamental rights. It was actually the question of state enforcement, judicial protection, and state capacity that kept these principles from being read as part of fundamental rights. If that is the understanding, and if that, that is an understanding which is supported by a reading of constitutional history, then why is it that we should, or has the time come for us to actually implement principles as rights, or can a directive principles of state policy trump the considerations of fundamental rights? This is a question which I do not have a clear answer to, but I can highlight a few factors which need to be considered in shaping a response to this question. First is, what does it mean, what does it mean to extend the equal protection of laws? If equal protection of laws itself means that there should be some sort of a positive duty accruing on behalf of the state, that would obviously mean that the state has a right, uh, the, the, the individual has a right to sort of give reservation, uh, to, to seek reservations. Second, how do, we define, how do we define the minimum core of a right? Every right can have a negative dimension, a positive dimension. A negative dimension which prevents the state from encroaching on, on a sort of certain domain of individual liberty. And a positive right which means that the state is expected to actually take some positive action in trying to pursue that right. The distinction between these two dimensions actually has actually been blurred in the recent past. But, but, I would, but my submission is that the content of the positive right itself, of any right, be it a right of equality, be, be it a right of non-discrimination, be it a right to free speech, be it a right to education, is itself circumscribed by the boundaries set by the negative right inherent in that provision. So no matter how appealing the positive right be, it cannot go beyond the boundaries set by the negative rights. The pursuit of a positive right cannot embrace the repeal of the negative, negative dimension of that right. Now, how has, that, how has this understanding sort of, uh, how has this debate been understood by the courts? If you look at the earlier set of cases, the Supreme Court was very, was very comfortable in, in thinking of Article 15.4 and 16.4 as exceptions. They thought that Article 15.1 and 14 and 16 gave a positive right, uh, gave a general principle, and Article 15.4 and 16.4 was a direct exception to Article 15.1 and 16.4, which meant that no matter what the right was, Article 15.4 and 16.4 could actually carve out something out of that right and could even do something which is antithetical to that right. This understanding of the Supreme Court sort of changed in the mid-70s with, with, with the case of Balaji, Anam Thomas, and even in the famous Mandel case. And now the understanding is that Article 15.4 and 16.4 are merely enabling provisions. They do not stand in direct contrast to Article 15.1 or 16.1, which basically means that even if you have something like Article 15.4 in the Constitution, it cannot, it cannot go against the spirit of Article 14 or the spirit of Article 15.1. Uh, the content of Article 15.4 is shaped by or controlled by the contours of Article 14 and Article 15.1. So there has been there has been this sort of a uh, there has been uh, this uh, change in, uh, in in the judicial attitude towards how they used to look at uh, 15 4 and 16 4 earlier and how they used to look at how they how they look at it right now. But even though they consider it as an enabling provision, the implications of considering something as an enabling provision are not clear. Why do you want to have an enabling provision in a constitution? when the enabling provision is anyway controlled by Article 14.1 and Article 15, Article 14 and Article 15.1. What is the special thing which we are achieving by having an enabling provision? The enabling provision obviously cannot repeal the Article 14 or Article 
nor, nor can it go against the spirit of equality. So in that sense, uh, it is my submission that article, article, uh, uh, the enabling provisions do not achieve much in terms of, uh, in terms of adding a new right or generating any positive commitment out of the state, apart from being used as a clarification, apart from being used as, as an exercise in public debate to clarify that the state shall have the power, just as it has the power under different state lists. If you look at the union list, the state list, the concurrent list, the state has a power to make laws on so many things. But that does not mean that we can actually approach the court tomorrow and say the state will make a law on this issue, or it will make a law of this character on this issue. The state should have the choice to choose which is the best policy to address inequality. It should choose whether it should have an equal opportunity commission, it should have a deprivation index, or it should have reservation. But by merely having a 15-4 in the constitution, we cannot change the idea of inequality, or the idea of redressing inequality to a permanent idea of reservation, caste-based reservation. So, so, so that, that is something which, to which I, I invite uh, the thoughts of, of, of all those who are sitting here. And I'll, I'll end with a lasting comment about uh, what, forms, what new forms is this old debate sort of assuming in our, in our times. So if our understanding is that 15.4 and 16.4 are, are no exceptions to 15.1, it means that uh, we cannot violate equality in trying to give reservations. In fact, reservations do not violate equality. They are, they are constitutional only to the extent that they are consistent with Article 15 and Article 14, which is what the provision, which is what the, the position is. Because all reservation policies, all reservation laws end up being questioned in the court of law. And the court finally examines if they are constitutionally permissible, if they do not breach the basic structure and, and, and such things. Which basically brings us back to the point that reservation are not exceptions. We should not think of them as exceptions. No matter the political support given to reservations, reservations cannot embrace a repeal of constitutional essentials or the basic structure doctrine. Yet, if you look at the last four or five amendments, or at least the last seven or eight amendments on reservation, starting from the 77th amendment, the 81st amendment, the 82nd amendment, the 85th amendment, the 93rd amendment, the 117th Amendment. All of these are amendments done to Article 15, Article 16, and Article 335. They have this dubious phrase inserted in the text of the Constitutional Amendment. It starts again with the phrase, nothing in this Constitution shall prevent the state from making any provision. And then it goes on to say that it provisions for reservations. So if we, if we cannot, if the, if the Supreme Court has been categorical about not viewing 15-4 and 16-4 as exceptions, what is the point of using this language of excep exceptionalism? Why do we want to carve a space for reservation outside the Constitution? Why can't we define it or justify it within the parameters of the Constitution? And even more, and with, 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 with even more concern, I, I want to point out the fact that all these amendments are products not of a genuine debate on the floor of the parliament as to what the content of reservation should be or what is the best means of pursuing uh, redressing inequality. In fact, they are absolute knee-jerk reactions to court orders which have, viol which have sort of struck down reservation laws. So the court strikes down a reservation policy in, in the state of Tamil Nadu and the parliament gears up for passing a constitutional amendment saying that nothing in this constitution shall prevent us from doing exactly what the court had actually prevented them from doing in that case. And this has happened too many times for us to be very uh, comfortable about this. This is a practice which has infiltrated our constitution. In fact, you cannot imagine a constitutional amendment on reservation without overturning a court order. Overturning the court order has become like the basic sort of, has become the most defining feature of our debate on reservation. And it uses these two things, which have actually landed us in the confusion. The non obstantic clause and an enabling provision. 
So I think the time has come for us to actually examine in rigor, in, with rigorous detail what is it that an enabling provision helps us to achieve. If an enabling provision cannot go beyond the text of the constitutional article itself, why is it that we use an enabling provision in the first place? And second, if notwithstanding clause or the non obstantive clause, which is used in constitutional amendments, is any way subject to basic structure doctrine, it does not bring you any additional layer of protection. What is the point of using such a high-handed sort of a phrase which says nothing in this constitution? If 10 of our reservation policies, or almost all of our reservation policies, are carved as an exception to the constitutional order, how far is it possible for us to defend reservations? Is it not a better mechanism, is it not a better policy to justify reservation without reference to the notwithstanding clause? To actually try and argue that reservation for, for promotions or reservation in the case of other backward classes is a necessary feature of our commitment under Article 14.1 or Article 15.1? Or is it the case that reservation can only be justified as exception? If that is the case, I think we must ask ourselves the final question, to what extent our constitution itself can be a list of exceptions and not a charter of norms? Thank you.